Good evening, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to St Paul's Church uh, for this Christmas carol service. Now, the very eagle-eyed among you will have noticed that I'm not Roger Royal. Uh, Roger, unfortunately, he's been through quite a tough time and he's just finished uh, some radiotherapy and he's not feeling very good. So, somewhat unusually for me, I'm in the position of being understudy. Uh, my name is Simon Grigg, and I have the honour of being rector of St Paul's Church, Covent Garden. I, I, I mention that only just in case you thought, you know, that, um, that Brad Pitt's let himself go a bit, you know. <laughs> so Christmas, we think, don't we, of all, all the joyous things of Christmas, amongst them, of course, uh, the nativity plays. And isn't it wonderful to be back after last year's debacle? So give yourselves a cheer for being back. Mr Johnson's just been talking. He's uh, announced some new restrictions. Mind you, if he announced that the sun had come out, I'd go and check. Um, but, um, yeah, no, 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 the nativity play is back. And, of course, one's reminded of the famous story of the nativity play written, directed and performed by nursery and reception children. And, of course, it comes to the famous scene where... Mary and Joseph arrive at the inn and talk to the innkeeper. And, of course, he famously says, well, there's no room. And Joseph says, well, you know, my wife is great with child. And the innkeeper says, well, that's not my fault. And Joseph says, yeah, well, it's not mine either. <laughs> so I'm sure it's, it's so good that you've come to support this really important charity. Um, but if it is within your tradition, uh, I invite you now to join with me in a prayer. Beloved in Christ, be it this Christmas tide our care and delight to hear again the message of the angels and in heart and mind to go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass and the babe lying in a manger. Therefore, let us read and mark in Holy Scripture the tale of the loving purposes of God from the first days unto the glorious redemption brought us by this holy child. But first, let us pray for the needs of the whole world, for peace on earth and goodwill among all people, for unity and brotherhood within the church and especially in this great city of London. And let us also remember, especially this year, we remember before God all those who rejoice with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light, that multitude which no man can number, whose hope was in the word made flesh, and with whom in the Lord Jesus we are forever one. And so may the almighty God bless us with his grace. Christ give us the joys of everlasting life, and unto the fellowship of the citizens above, May the King of Angels bring us all. Amen. We stand to sing the carol, O come, all ye faithful.
Good evening. Um, this reading is a, a poem by U.A. Fanshawe, who is a lady poet with a wonderful freestyle. She lived uh, 1920 to 1990, so I don't think she'll mind too much if I've adapted it somewhat. It's a story about someone who was at the birth of Christ 2,000 years ago. Well, not quite at the birth, and not actually a person. It was the sheepdog <laughs> owned by the shepherds who watched their flocks by night. <clears throat> it all started with this bright light, and then there was this big bird, and birds started talking. Well, I started barking, shut up, Shep, shut up, they said. And lads fell on their knees. And then there were all this singing, and sky filled up with wings. And then, nothing. Well, lads got up. we better be off then. Well, I'm up wagging me tail. Stay, Shep, stay. So they went off, and I had to stay behind and mind sheep. They were gone ages. When they come back, they were all excited, not at seeing me, but what they seen. Kings and camels and, and gifts. Not gifts for animals. They were not the kind you could eat. No, they were for a baby. A baby lad. Gifts were for him. Our lads took him a lamb. I wish they took me. I'm very good with lambs. I'd be lovely with baby. I'd have smelt it. But I wouldn't have licked it. No, they get, get they go mad if you do that. No, no, but I'd have, I'd have, I'm sure the baby would have liked me. I'm sure the baby would have liked me better than a humping great camel.
Good evening. This is the second epistle from Joseph to the Corinthians. Dear Corinthians, I acknowledge safe receipt of your epistle in response to my epistle, commonly known for reasons that escape me, as the first epistle to the Corinthians. Concerning the recent sojourn with my wife Mary in Bethlehem, or as your brochure puts it, the city of David. For a travel company of repute, both Mary and I find your explanations of the accommodation arrangements far from satisfactory. If we have to make the journey again, which I hope we do not in the light of what occurred once we were there, it will most certainly not be with Corinthians 13, 18 to 30 holidays. I offer the following response to your explanations. One, I have looked again at your brochure. I do not agree that the description of the inn includes the outhouses. The words travelers with cattle can expect the use of the stables surely refers to the cattle, not the guests. You may say that there are many worse off than ourselves. Unfortunately, they all seem to have been booked with your company. You will have to take it from me, too, that Mary giving birth to the Son of God was totally unexpected. <laughs> and I can assure you that had I known he was on the way, I would have given you the opportunity of bringing in your own PR people. Three, I agree with your proposition that from every point of view, the story has more appeal, set as it is in a stable rather than in the twin-bedded room with half board that we had booked. I also agree that it was much more convenient that the angel to make his way across the yard and into the stable rather than going through the residence lounge. <laughs> of course, I accept that the presence of the entire heavenly host praising God along the corridor on the second floor of the inn might have resulted in complaints from your other guests, but that does not address my main complaint. My wife, Mary, has little in common with shepherds. It was bad enough having to cope with livestock in the stable, but having to face a deputation of local sheep farmers who claimed that they were tired of abiding in their fields at night was not our idea of local color. Your decision to include them as an optional extra in next year's brochure does not impress us. Four. I know you are denying you had anything to do with the couriers who arrived from the East bearing gifts, but I still maintain that I had seen one of them in your office when I booked the trip. <laughs> I do not wish to appear ungrateful, but at a time when I was struggling with a newly born child, an exhausted wife, a group of fanatical shepherds, assorted livestock, an angel explaining that my son was the everlasting father and the entire heavenly host, the arrival of three Corinthian holiday representatives in fancy dress did little to help. And by the way, they could have brought something a little more practical. Yours very truly, Joseph. want a lot for Christmas There is just one thing I need I don't care about the presents I don't need the Christmas tree I just want you for my own Make my wish come true Chris. 
Christmas There is just one thing I need And I don't care about the presents Underneath the Christmas tree I don't need to hang my stocking There upon the fireplace Santa Claus will make me happy With a toy on Christmas Day Cause I just want you for my own Brightly everywhere, and the sound of children laughter fills the air, and everyone is singing. I hear those little bells ringing. Santa, won't you please bring me what I really need? Won't you please bring my baby to me? I don't want a lot this Christmas. This is all I'm asking for. I just want to see my baby standing right outside my door. Cause I just want you for my own. More than you could ever know. Make my wish come true.
Um, wow. Um, I'm here with Gaz Emerson now, um, and I think we might do a duet. Should we do Rocking Around the Christmas Tree? Sure, that's a hard act to follow, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I know. Um, it, this is a really lovely section I've been asked to do tonight, talking with supporters, and Gaz is one of the most inspirational of the lot here. Uh, since his diagnosis with Ewing sarcoma in 2014 and finding out it was terminal in, last year, uh, he's raised over £111,000 for Sarcoma UK. So it's an incredible achievement, and I think that deserves a round of applause. I actually had, my, had a 40th birthday at the weekend trying to raise a bit of money, got nowhere near that. So. <laughs> yeah, but at least, you know, every bit counts. So it's really nice to, to talk to, to Gaz now and find out a bit about his journey and uh, what his plans are for, for the coming weeks and months ahead, really. So, uh, Gaz, tell us a bit about how your journey with sarcoma began and how you are now. So it all started by getting diagnosed with it in 2014. Um, I got diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. Um, and underwent different chemo and radiotherapy treatments and I've been going through different ones over the last sort of eight years on and off um, and then in November last year it became terminal and I decided that I want to focus on something positive um, there was a lot of negativity involved around cancer so a positive mindset and focus on something else um, so I decided to cycle the length of the country and raise as much money as possible so taking on cancer was not enough and decided to try and take on a big challenge instead. So it was part of your bucket list, wasn't it? This, the, the, yeah. the Land's End to John O'Groats. John O'Groats to Land's End, even. No, Land's End to no, John O'Groats. Yeah, yeah, John right, yeah. yeah. Um, either way, it's still tough as heck, isn't it? So um, what made you choose that as a challenge for your bucket list? Um, so originally, it was, we were talking about what challenge would you do. Um, and I really, really enjoyed traveling. And we decided to do this in January last year. Um, and obviously, we couldn't travel around because of the pandemic. So we were like, we'll travel the length of the country and do it over a few days. Um, and get some saddle sores on the way. Yeah, fair play to you. <laughs> um, the motivation to do that then, what, what was it, you know, for, for, for anybody attempting that, that kind of challenge, it's, you know, it's really daunting, isn't it? So yeah. for yourself to get up for it, to get ready for it, how did you do that? What was it that you got um, in the zone for it? So I think for me personally, um, it was knowing that I could make a difference by raising a lot of money. I didn't think I'd raise anywhere near that amount. Um, but we set out on a journey to raise um, 15,500 initially, which I knew would go some way to helping, um, whether it be treatments or s the services that Sarcoma UK offer to sarcoma sufferers. Um, so yeah, decided to do that. And what was the reaction from your friends and family when you told them you were doing it? Amazing and so supportive. Um, and I've got a few of them here in the crowd yeah. tonight. And my dad decided he was gonna cycle it with me. Oh wow, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then I've got two friends there. <laughs> And then I suppose as far as like the fundraising side um, and my nan and uh, Tony over there decided to do some old school fundraising and went leafleting around our oh. hometown of Shrewsbury, Shropshire and yeah. yeah, we brought thousands in, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. All them cold walks and windy nights. Yeah. Leafleting needs to come back. Yeah. yeah. Who cares about Facebook ads? Leafy, <laughs> I mean, joking. Um, so the way that it all played out for you then, the way it all sort of like kind of came together, was, was there anything that you sort of thought of on that journey that you know you kept in your head that you thought of when you were when you were doing it? Um, I think it was just all the messages that, because obviously with a just giving page, everyone sends you messages on the back of the, the sponsorship that they donate. So it's it was in it was really inspirational for me to see some of the stuff that they and that kept me going. Mm. Um, and I think yeah, knowing that. My nan was out there getting the fundraising and really once it had gone over the, even the 15,000 mile, which we managed to get to in sort of 24, um, 48 hours, there's no backing out. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> once you're in it, yeah, you're locked you're in. You're in it for the long run. <laughs> so, um, so you've been recognised by the Pride of Britain as well, awards as well, haven't you? So that, that's an incredible achievement. Yeah, so I got put forward um, by Sarcoma UK um, for the London um, Pride of Britain award. Uh, and then, yeah, I went to the event... Um, with all the other finalists and, and meeting them as well that, that actual event to go to that was so special met Holly and Phil oh yeah that was quite cool <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah no the, the whole journey has and, and this is what I was on about taking something so negative it's been such a positive journey and all these things on the back of it has really made it sure uh, what is next for you then what is the, the next challenge for yourself as you're a man that likes to keep active aren't you um, so I've decided I want to take as many people as possible um, over the three peaks. So I want to open it up and I want lots of people from the sarcoma 
community to jump on board. Um, and we're not sure, maybe we do one um, over 24 hours and one over the three days. So it opens it up to everyone. But yeah, get as many people to go and raise as much money as we can. Okay, sounds good. How do people get involved with that, do you reckon? So, Kerry. <laughs> there we are. But we will have it. How will we get people involved with it, Kerry? Fine. Right, we'll That's it. That's I'll be there. Love it. I think that probably is a cue for me to be there as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right, better get, better get fit for that. Um, Gaz, thank you for your time. Um, and everybody else, thanks for listening. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, we hope you have been inspired by Gaz's story. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
Thank you, Mark, so much. It's lovely to follow that, isn't it? Um, and what a title, Reflecting on the Year. Well, it's been bloody awful, hasn't it? I mean, let, you know, let's be honest. Um, it's not been a great year for any... And the, the White Christmas always means quite a lot to me because um, many years ago I was preparing the church for the Midnight Mass, which we're able to have again this year, but not last, you see. So I'm sort of getting ready. And I hear sleigh bells. And I thought, oh, come on, you are really losing it. I mean, the, you know, <laughs> sleigh bells. But there were. And what was happening was as a horse and carriage was coming down the central aisle of the garden. So I went out to remonstrate because, it, you know, it is my property. And um, anyway, <laughs> well, it's God's, but I'm looking after it. Um, and um, and anyway, and this chap got out and, and knelt down and, and proposed. And I thought, and I was, oh, I mean, I was ever so moved. I was not quite, quite tearful, you see. Anyway, um, so I, I said, well, well, you better come in, you know, and, and come to the Midnight Mass, and then you, the lady, better give him the answer at the end of the Mass, you see. So that's exactly what happened, and we were having mulled wine. I won't go on for long, because there's mulled wine at the back any minute now, but... Um, so they... they, they she did, in fact, say yes. And I said, well, then you must get married here, you see. So, marvellous. Anyway, I heard no more. And I thought, oh, dear. Well, obviously it didn't work out. <laughs> Until about 18 months later. And they'd been involved in a near-fatal car crash. They'd both been horribly, horribly injured. But they survived. And they did, indeed, get married here about two years later. People are often surprised that, as well as, you know, doing the day job, which involves, according to my PA, uh, dressing up in clothes and waving your arms about. That's how he described it. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated by cosmology, by the Big Bang and, and quasars and all that, all that garbage that they put on the telly with, you know, uh, Brian Cox. Um, and, and, in fact, we light the great star. You see the starburst, which is obviously the star of Bethlehem. And... When I found out when I was a sort of teenager, you know, that, that the stars in the sky are all just nuclear furnaces like, like our sun, just an incredibly long way away, I, that kind of blew my mind. And it always has blown my mind. And I think it's something about perspective. Ask any clergyman or woman. There's really only one taboo subject nowadays, and it's death. I mean, you can talk about sex and drugs and rock and roll till you're blue in the face. But any clergyman will tell you, you bring up the subject of death in a, a polite dinner party and everyone goes very silent and you're not invited again, which, of course, can be handy quite often. But, um, <laughs> but, of course, this last year has forced us to confront death. Almost all of us have had to confront death. Uh, you and many of the people you know and support, of course, have had to do that. And there's no... I mean, I, I, my mother died of um, Alzheimer's a, a few years ago, and people are always writing books like, you know, God and Dementia. I thought, oh, bollocks to that, because, I mean, it, it, it is awful, and there's no good pretending that, you know, these terrible diagnoses are anything other than truly terrible. And there's no sugarcoating that. But there is something about perspective... There is something about the way you look at these things that happen to us. I don't believe for a moment they're sent by God. I, I, that's not my idea of God. But I do think the way we perceive them, the perspective we take on them, can make a difference. And I don't just think that. I know that because I heard Gaz tonight. I mean, what an extraordinary change of perspective. So... I'm so grateful to be here tonight, um, to hear stories like that, wonderful performers, but just sat here thinking about the perspective, the perspective of the universe, from a Christian perspective, the perspective of God as one with us, coming to share our lives, to die, yeah, like us, but Christians believe, to rise again. So that's my perspective on tonight. I still think reflecting on the air, it's still bloody awful.
for being so short. <clears throat> light of the world. Let there be light, he said. Ah, but what sort of light? That's where we come in. Allow us to introduce ourselves, senior consultants, cherubim and seraphim technical services. <laughs> Sound and lighting engineers by appointment to the almighty. Special rates for miracles and plagues. Discount on all feedings of 5,000 or more, and three free Thunderbolt with each repeat order. No doubt you'll be familiar with some of our past productions. We did Story of Noah. Floodlit, of course. Oh, God. The Tower of Babel. With subtitles. And Sodom and Gomorrah. One of our most successful features. <laughs> An epic of biblical proportions, according to the critics. Not that there were many critics left afterwards. <laughs> And, of course, the wanderings in the desert. Low-budget soap opera, but it ran and ran. Forty years lit by a single pillar of fire and a seven-branched candelabra. But that was all before privatisation. Lighting's a tough business these days, lots of competition. It's a jungle out there in the desert. So many options, you see. Sunlight, moonlight, streetlight, neon light. Budweiser light. You've got to be in there with this newfangled electricity. Well, that's the current thinking. Oh. <laughs> and now, this new script. Strangers of the Lot. The Nativity. Don't know how he conceived this one. Scene one. Shepherds watching. Enter Gabriel with backing vocals. Need a good clear sky for that. Quick burst of heavenly host and blackout. Music from the Hallelujah Chorus. No, Handel hasn't been born yet. It'll have to be something by Cliff. It was much simpler in Moses' day. 
No 747s over Cairo Airport. Anything flying at night had to be an angel. Scene two. Wise men searching. Shouldn't that be wild men searching? Ought to have direct sunshine. But these humans can't look straight at the sun. We'll need the light of faith. Soft starlight with a single moving follow spot. Scene three, King Herod's palace. Well, someone's taken his grumpy pills this morning. Torches will do for him. Lots of flickering flames. Herod needs to get used to working in a hot place. Then cue the dream sequence. And the Magi leave unnoticed by a side exit. Scene four, a packed public house. No problem getting atmosphere for this. Jukebox playing Little Donkey. A TV in the corner showing the rerun of David v Goliath Championship Fight. <laughs> Enter distressed couple. Woman heavily pregnant, unable to get near bar. Clearly they don't drink Carling Black Label. Artificial lights for this one. People don't want to see too clearly when they are enjoying themselves. And a big glowing exit sign. This way for stable relationship. Oh. Final scene, the nativity. Total darkness? Well, there's a challenge. This must be God's avant-garde period. We should be grateful at least he doesn't want us to fill the stage with children and animals. Oh, why does he do this? Just when it needs a big finale. Not exactly primetime material. A closing scene in a shed with one 40-watt light bulb resting on a sleeping ass. A show like this will get him crucified in the ratings. Never mind. I've put in for the contract to light the Book of Revelation. That's bound to be a showstopper. Hold on. There's one more stage direction. Enter the light of the world. Ah. That should be quite effective. Yeah, that ought to do the trick. I wonder if St. Michael has any vacancies in merchandising. Charity Sarcoma UK. Uh, I'm glad to see so many of you here. I'd like to do a couple of songs that are very Christmassy, and I hope at any point, if you'd like to sing along and join in, please feel free to do so. Thank you.
Well, what an evening. Uh, just a very quick piece of housekeeping. Uh, there is a bar available at the back, uh, but there is also a retiring collection. Now, if you would like to make a donation, it's really very simple. You take out your wallet, you take out your donation, you fold it up, and you put it in the plate. <laughs> hope that's clear. Can I, on your behalf, thank all our wonderful entertainers this evening? It really has been an outstanding programme. So thank you all very much. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to greet him with joy when he comes. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and all whom you love in this world and the next, this night and always. Amen.